You know, I think that each one of us know somebody who started out in the faith. They, they professed Christ as Lord. They uh, attended church regularly. They, they may have even um, been part of, of a ministry in the church. And you thought so much of them and their involvement. And then one day, something in their life caught up to them. Um, maybe it's some sort of economic hardship. They, they lost their job and they weren't able to find a new one. Uh, maybe it, it was a difficulty in their marriage. Maybe a loss of a loved one. I, I think we all know somebody who has gone through this and we find them have a different relationship with God. Suddenly they start to talk as if God is not really involved in their life, that God isn't concerned about the things that they're concerned about. And they begin to take this, this self-talk very personal. And then one day you come to church and you don't see them sitting in the place that they normally sit. And then week after week, you notice that they have not returned. You reach out to them. They don't call you back. You eventually run into them and you start to talk to them. And, and they still talk about Christ as their Lord, but there's something different about their tone. There's something different about their relationship. And, you know, they still talk about God being with them, but you just know that there's something different. And perhaps over time you begin to realize, if they open up to you, that they still do believe in God and they still do believe that Christ died for their sins, but they also believe that God just doesn't care about the things that are happening in their life. And they believe because God doesn't care, what doesn't matter if they're part of a, a community, part of a church. Well, today's message, the, the scriptures that we're going to look at in the book of Acts, gives us a glimpse to help us realize that, that even the apostles struggled in their relationship with Christ. And my hope is that as we go through this passage and as we come to the end of it, we can see that there is some hope in the fact that just because certain people are in a certain place in their relationship with Christ, it doesn't mean that, that they're gone. It doesn't mean that they're lost. So if you would open up the book of Acts to chapter 1, and we are going to look at two, uh, three verses, verses 12 to 14. If you would and you find it, please stand for the reading of God's Word. Chapter 1, starting at verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. All of these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers. Father, we thank you for this time that you have given us, for this place that we can come together to study your word. We thank you, Lord. Father, I pray that these words would become real to us, that we would understand the people that you have put before us that we can learn from, that we could grow in the hope of all that you have provided us and the love and guidance that you inject into each one of our lives. Father, I pray that you would just open our hearts and our minds to receive this word, to grow in faith and to grow as your people. Father, we thank you and we love you. And we pray this in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. These three verses that we see here in Acts, they give us a powerful glimpse of the church as it was. And, and really more than that, it, it gives us a glimpse to how the church started, how these apostles came together and gave us what we have before us today. It's so easy for us to look at a verse like uh, verse 12 and, and look at it and believe that it's just such a, a simple narrative verse that it's so plain in its reading, what really could we get out of it? Well, today 
what I want to show us is that while it is a simple verse, a simple description of the beginning of the church, um, there's actually a lot there for us to realize. And, and what is there, I think, has such a strong application to our lives, the normal lives that we live in between the Sundays um, to help us realize that the church, the apostles especially, are not too far from us. So imagine, if you will, the roller coaster ride that the apostles went through in a relatively short period of time. This place that they find themselves in the Mount of Olives, this is the same place, Mount of Olives, all of it, that, uh, that, that Jesus took them to, to talk about uh, the, the end of the age. So you, if you imagine yourself at this time and you hear Jesus telling you that, that there's trouble coming, that there's going to be wars and rumors of wars and this description that Jesus gives his apostles, you think that, wow, this is sort of a, a troubling message at the time. This is the same place, Mount of Olives, that Jesus found seclusion and, and comfort. They came, the apostles and Jesus came to this place to rest. They came to this place after the Lord's Supper, after the Passover meal. This place that Jesus has taken them be, uh, before his ascension is the same place that Jesus told his apostles that he would be struck down and that his, that the disciples would be scattered like sheep. And of course, it's the same place when, when Peter heard this, stood up and says, no, not me, Lord. I will fight to the death. Your words that would land up haunting Peter very soon. It's interesting that this place that Jesus continually came back to as he started his ministry in Jerusalem, this place that he went to to rest and to pray was such a center point in the ministry of Jesus when, when he was in this area. And so you might want to think of the emotions that the, that, that the followers of Jesus may have experienced at this very place. This is the place that, that we see our Lord. We see the, the physical and the emotional and mental toll that it was taking on him as the, 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 the time approached of his betrayal and the time of, of his arrest as he weighed the fact that he was about to sacrifice himself. This is the very place that Jesus is arrested. So imagine the apostles seeing their Lord being arrested. And just as Jesus predicted, it is where the apostles fled. It's in this place that we just learned that the apostles watched Jesus ascend into heaven. And this place, the Mount of Olives, this is the place where Zechariah prophesies that Jesus would one day return. Most of us are very familiar with the story that got us to this point, meaning that we all remember the point that when Jesus is arrested and his disciples scatter, we are familiar with the idea that the disciples ran and hid. Something I don't know if we really recognize, though, from the text is that the apostles and the followers of Jesus never really come back together again immediately. So what we have in Scripture, what we look at, for example, is after the resurrection of Jesus. We remember that it's Mary Magdalene and some of the women go to see the empty tomb. They return, we learn, to tell some of the, to tell the apostles in another gospel account, we learn that it's Peter that runs back to the tomb because he doesn't believe the women. And he himself looks into the empty tomb and he marvels about what had happened, which is sort of a strange statement when you think about it because the women just told him what happened because the angels told the women. But Peter walks away like wondering, gee, I, I really wish I knew what happened to Jesus. We see that the, the next snapshot that we're given in Scripture is that we learn about two men walking to Emmaus. And Jesus appears before them, interact with Jesus. 
One gospel account tells us that these two men from going to Emmaus go back to tell the apostles, and the apostles don't believe them. Are you beginning to see that there is something wrong right now with the apostles? They don't seem to be the same people that we see in, in some of the gospel accounts. This isn't the same, you know, John, for example, that wants to pray down fire. They seem to have lost a little bit of their confidence, a little bit of their enthusiasm. Again, we are familiar with the idea that they are running and hiding. But did you ever realize that they're not running and hiding together? Throughout the gospel accounts, the consistent message that Jesus tells his followers is to meet me in Galilee. Go before me in Galilee and I will meet you there. Galilee is 80 miles away from Jerusalem. And so it's interesting that many of the snapshots that we see in the Gospels are not happening in Galilee. They're happening around Jerusalem. They're happening on the road to Emmaus. They're, they're happening in other places. We see multiple snapshots of Jesus appearing before a group of apostles. And then we learn, for example, but Thomas wasn't there. And then later on in John, we have the passage where Jesus appears again, and now to Thomas. And it's where we get that, that beautiful verse, my Lord and my God. But I want us to pay attention that the apostles are not together. The followers of Jesus are separated. They're, they're fractured. It is certainly not the picture that I think that we often are received when we just quickly read through the end of the gospel accounts. Because so often we have this phrase, and Jesus appeared for the disciples or the apostles, or the apostles heard, and we assume that, that all of them were there, but the scriptures point out that they were not all there. You know, we see, for example, when as we get closer to this uh, get-together in Galilee, we see Jesus appears before seven disciples fishing. Seven it seems that there are more of them in Galilee. And it's interesting that Jesus is calling them to Galilee. And what's interesting about that is you may remember that Galilee is the same place that Jesus actually started his earthly ministry. You may recall that after his baptism and he goes into the wilderness to be tempted and after he goes through the period of temptation, immediately he goes to Galilee and we see in scripture that he begins to assemble his apostles and he begins to do his earthly ministry here. And recalling to that, that moment, we see that once again, Jesus is reassembling his team in Galilee and we begin to realize that it's, it's, it's really fascinating that he goes back to where his earthly ministry began to take a journey that he had already taken once, that is, to go back to Jerusalem. And so now he has his team together again, and they take this 80-mile journey back to Jerusalem, back to the city that killed their Lord. We don't fault I don't think we do. Fault the apostles for being scared, for fleeing from the place that killed our Lord. I think the apostles had every reason to be afraid of this place. But here they are, walking together, back to a city, back to a community that had already demonstrated real danger and a real threat. And then on top of that, they're going back to the very same place, the Mount of Olives, where the, all the apostles scattered. You know, in many ways, I think of this moment, this moment that the apostles are coming back to the Mount of Olives as, as their restoration, as their reconciliation back to Christ. It's sort of their less dramatic uh, moment that Jesus had with Peter when, when Jesus asked Peter, Peter, do you love me? 
I think this return back to the same place that all the apostles scattered is this moment where the apostles find themselves back into a restored relationship. Not that Jesus had a problem with the apostles, but rather the apostles were ashamed and afraid of how they reacted to when Jesus left them. And so now it's almost like a do-over. Jesus takes them from Galilee, walking back to Jerusalem, back to the Mount of Olives where they had their incident, where they all scattered. But this time, when Jesus ascends to heaven, when Jesus leaves them, instead of them being afraid, instead of them worrying about what was going to happen to them now, they have peace. They have confidence. They have comfort. They have unity. They understand now what it is that Jesus has planned for them and what it is that they're going to be doing. You know, I heard probably two or three years ago, I heard a sermon talking about how when the apostles were with Jesus, they, they lacked faith. That the apostles really didn't have faith in Jesus until the resurrection. And that really, that's an inaccurate and uncharitable view of, of, what, of what the apostles had gone through and where the apostles were in their walk with Jesus. Yeah, I, I put it this way, that, that there was a lot that the apostles knew about Jesus. They had a lot of mental knowledge about who Jesus is and what he was doing. But I think we can say that they didn't have a strong application of that faith. And I think oftentimes we see that when we look at the gospel accounts, so we, that we see followers of Jesus who want to be faithful, they want to be obedient, but they don't really know what that looks like in the context of Jesus' ministry at the time. I was thinking about some of my own hang-ups in life. You know, for example, uh, you know, I'll tell you now, um, I have a, 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 a significant fear of heights, really an unreasonable fear of heights. Um, I remember as a teenager, there was many times where my friends, when they were just getting into rock climbing, and they'd invite me to go, and I'd think, yeah, that'd be fun, and I'll go rock climbing with them. And there'd be a certain point that I'd be climbing, and I just couldn't go any further. And then I would try it again. And I'd get to a certain point, and there'd be a part of my brain that tells my body to stop cooperating. And um, then I would just fall off the rock and be a little frustrated that I had such a fear. Uh, then my friend thought, well, maybe we can do the repelling thing. That would be fun. And I thought, sure. Because again, it's an unreasonable fear. I, I, you know, I, like right now, if somebody invited me to go do something that dealt with great heights, I would say, yeah, let's do it. And then we'd come to a certain point and my body would say, are you crazy? This isn't, this isn't prudent, this isn't good. So even repelling, it's when you hike up the easy side of a rock, you anchor up at the top, and then you have to take that first step off the, the cliff to, to repel. And I'd get to the cliff and I would look down and my body would say, no, we're not doing that. My mind is saying, no, let's do it. This equipment is safe. It can hold like an elephant. We're good to go. But my body is saying, no, we're not going to do this. I saw a, a, a video uh, probably a couple years ago. I, I Oftentimes I listen to uh, YouTube videos when I'm working because my work doesn't require me to do a whole great deal of thinking. Um, and while I was working, I started hearing in my headphones people screaming, uh, like, like blood curdling, they're going to die screaming. And so I click over to the web browser to see what it is that is playing. And it is a compilation of rock climbing accidents. <sighs> and so to help you understand what this video really is, is that people climbing up rocks and their friends are recording them on you know, like a GoPro and it captures the moment when they slip off the rock and, and as they slip off and they realize that they are going to fall, they scream a sincere scream of, this is the end. 
But very quickly, the rope that they're attached to catches them. They don't hurt themselves. And they dangle there for a moment, realize that they are safe by their safety equipment, and then they scurry back up to where they need to go. There's probably 12 or so of these videos in succession of people doing exactly that. The slipping off the rock, screaming in different ways, except there were two videos in this compilation where they started to slip and they just let go of the rock. No drama. They knew that the climbing equipment they were attached to was more confident and more sure than their ability to climb. Another climber was climbing to a point to, there was an invert in the rock, and in order to get to the next handhold, he had to jump for the handhold. And so he gets ready, he crutches down on the rock, he goes to jump for it, he's got the handhold, and then you can start to see he's slipping from the handhold, and he just lets go. And he drops, the rope catches him, and he dangles there for a moment as he swings himself back to the rock. And he is high. You can see in the background, the little tiny trees way in the background. My point of sharing this story is both types of climbers have faith in the equipment that they are using. But there is only one type of climber that has the applied confidence and faith. And that is the one that's able to let go of the rock and be suspended by the rope without the drama of the blood-curdling scream. <laughs> but I promise you that if those rock climbers who were screaming in the beginning stick with it, there comes a point where they actually recognize that the safety equipment that they haul around with them up a rock is actually more confident and sure than their ability to actually scale that rock. And when they slip off of it, they also don't scream. In much the same way, when I look at Acts and I see the apostles in the way they are at this moment, I see that type of confidence in them now. You know, I think that there is a habit that we often convince ourselves that because we are children of God, because we're in Christ, that somehow because of that relationship, that we are not going to find ourselves in harm's way. That God would not let us get hurt. That God would not let us feel financial hardship. That God would not let us have this type of tragedy or, or discomfort in our life. But I want us to change our thinking a bit. Because attached to that is the the common notion that when you do experience hardship, that you must somehow not be in God's will. That when you took a job that didn't turn out the way you wanted it to turn out, that somehow, that, that oh, God must have not have wanted this for me. I must have made the wrong decision. I want us to, to just set that whole idea aside because I want us to recognize that when we look at Scripture, that there are times where God wants us to go into the lion's den. That there are times where God's will is for us to go into the oven. We cannot be surprised and want to run when we find ourselves in the ocean, caught in the storm, and then shipwrecked. Because when we look at Scripture, these are the recurring patterns of what it means to follow God. Or in the case here for the apostles, the fact that they are being called back to a city, into a situation that they know, if it was up to them, was impossible, was dangerous, and it had already proven deadly. And then they do what we ought to do when we find ourselves in that situation, and that is keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. This journey that, that we see the apostles going through, what they go through, what we see in the gospel accounts, and what we begin to see unfold here in Acts, 
is that transference of that, that information that each one of us in this room have about God. You know, we all have tremendous theological knowledge in our minds about the faithfulness of God, about the love of God, about the, 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 the steadfast love of God. We all know in our minds, many of us can repeat the Bible verses, we can sing the Psalms, but the process of being a Christian is taking that information that we all store up in our heads and through life experience, through trials and struggle, by actually experiencing the faithfulness of God, of having that information transferred from our heads and into our hearts. And that is what we see here when we begin to see these new apostles come into a city that they had already run from once. And so once scattered, we, need, we now see them calmly together in perfect unity. Luke records the names of all of the remaining 11 apostles so that we would know that they are together. I think the reason why all 11 names are listed together is because previous to this moment, not all 11 names are listed. As I mentioned, we, we go through the, those last chapter, last two chapters of the Tenewood Gospel account you're looking at, and, and you see fragments of, of apostles here and a group over there. But here at this moment, all 11 of them are together. And then Luke adds this, he says, And all of these, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. This is quite the contrast for the simple reason that the last time we saw these people together, the apostles didn't believe the women. They were at odds with each other. They were skeptical. They weren't together in unity. They weren't praying together. And here at this moment, we see them together. The apostles with the women that they once didn't believe. And then even better than that, the brothers of Jesus are there. And I love the fact that this is added, that this is shared with us in Acts, because you may remember that the brothers of Jesus were not followers of Jesus. John 7, 5, we, say, we read that not even his brothers believed in him, the him being Jesus. Mark records for us this moment where after Jesus has, has healed somebody and he's collected his apostles, he's, he's appointed them, he's named them. Um, the, the very next passage we read in Mark chapter 321. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying he is out of his mind. That's Jesus' family. His brothers thought that Jesus was out of his mind. They were going to collect him. And you may remember the very next passage is when Mary and his family go out and then the, the people around Jesus say, hey, your mother and your brother are here. And Jesus asks that question, who are my mother and, and who, are, who are my brothers? You may not remember the reason why they were there is because they wanted to collect Jesus. They were worried about Jesus. They were not followers. And yet here in Acts, we see that even Jesus' skeptics, his closest skeptics, now sit with the apostles and sit with the women, sit with the people that we know had followed Jesus, and now his brothers are there, and they as well are waiting for God's next instruction. Waiting in unity. Praying. The uh, comment, the, the phrase, with one accord, in some translations reads, uh, with one mind. Uh, one paraphrase translation adds, with one mind and one purpose. What the text really wants to express to us is that they were just so together, so united in what they were about to embark on. And this is so relevant for us today as Christians. You know, I, I think too often we as Christians are more comfortable fighting with each other than we are with the hostile world that surrounds us. You know, I, I want us 
to acknowledge as a family that it's actually okay that we disagree with each other sometimes. That there are many things in Scripture we do not need to agree emphatically about. You know, there are many things that you might have heard or maybe been involved in your own conversations, whether it's about the end times, about topics such as the rapture, about the purpose of, of baptism and the Lord's Supper. Um, in some congregations, there's controversy over uh, a women covering their head. Some congregations, you get very upset about what you wear or don't wear. I want us to recognize that we ought to be able to have conversations with each other without us leaving, treating the other person as if they are another Judas who has just betrayed our Lord. You know, it's important for us to be able to have these conversations and go to Scripture and wrestle with Scripture. I think that's healthy. I think it's what helps us to be able to go to Scripture and, and to dialogue together and wrestle about some of the things uh, that, that we may not understand clearly. But that is not a reason for us to speak ill of our brother or sister or to mischaracterize their relationship with Christ. Heard a, a message uh, you know, a year ago, and it's talking about uh, you know people will know that you're my disciples if you love me or you love each other. And somebody said that you know that verse is not you know people will know that you're my disciples if you fight with each other. And I think sometimes Christians uh, we we forget that. I want us to acknowledge that doesn't mean that we all accept doctrine blindly or my teachings blindly. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't hold each other accountable if we are in sin. This isn't a live and let live idea. It's about being charitable and loving in our engagements. You know, I was thinking about as, as I approach next week and, and preach a, a different message uh, regarding my call to be your pastor, and I was thinking about the fact that you, know, you and I can agree on hundreds of doctrinal issues, and, and, and truthfully, we probably do. We probably agree far more than we disagree on many of the doctrines that we find in Scripture. But there is really only one doctrine in the Bible that allows us to be brothers or to call, I can call you my sister. And that is our understanding of the gospel. There is one message in the Bible that's the overarching message throughout all of Scripture. It's the reason why Jesus bled and died. It's that message that we have to get right. It's our common confession, our common realization that it is the, by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and our faith in that act alone that knits us together as a family, that unifies us. And that is why here in Acts we can now see the apostles and the women and the brothers of Jesus Unified together, because we'll find out that they do have some disagreements. We see it in Acts. We see it in some of the letters and the epistles. But there is a plain recognition that there is something far greater that unifies them. And it is their common faith in what Jesus had accomplished. Hear the words of Paul, as inspired by the Holy Spirit. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling of which you have been called, in all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with love, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Do you hear Paul's point in this message? This unity in our common faith 
in our common acknowledgement of our one hope. So as we consider this moment of unity that we see in Acts, I really want us to remember where the apostles started. As a group broken, the very foundation of their faith fractured when Jesus was taken from them. Again, that the, the equivalent to where we might find ourselves today, that job loss or that hardship or the loved one that was unexpectedly taken from us and how it shakes our faith. And here, they lost something far greater. They lost the foundation of their faith, or at least they thought they did. And now we see them in this moment in Acts, restored in perfect unity, with confidence. You know, I, when I imagine the apostles this time around, instead of fleeing like they did last time from, from Mount of Olives, now I, I actually imagine they had a, a bounce in their step as they walked towards Jerusalem. There was a confidence that they carried with them as they walked in to take on the next, uh, next task that was before them. I imagine it was the same confidence that, that Daniel had as he was being marched to the lion's den. I think it was the same confidence that Daniel's three friends had as they faced the imminent danger of the furnace. Because the danger that the apostles were about to walk into was no less threatening than the events that we see in Daniel. But they had confidence, and they were unified in that confidence. So this morning, as you reflect on that, what I want you to have is I, I want to exhort you to be unified and who we are in Christ. I acknowledge it, and I think we all can acknowledge it. There are going to be things that we disagree on. But I want us to remember what holds us together. And I want us to remember the importance of our testimony as we go out in this community. That, that the people around us know us by how we love each other and how we care for each other. That the people in our community can see the difference in our behavior and in how we interact with people. That we don't just have to tell them that we're Christians, they can tell that we're Christians by not just how we treat each other, but also how we treat everybody around us. Because that's the type of unity that we see from the apostles in the book of Acts. I know that each one of you would affirm that, confidently affirm that we were saved by an amazing God and that we serve a tremendous and amazing Lord. What I'm asking is that when we go out in this world, we act like that's true. Father, we thank you for your word that we are able to, to look at and to study and to share. And Father, I pray that you would be with each one of us. Reach us, Lord, in a way that only you can. Give us a heart of compassion for the people around us, Lord, that we would be strong witnesses the way you have called us to be, Lord, that we would care for one another and love each other, that we would support each other, that we would do the work that you have called us to do, Father. Many parts of what I am praying, Lord, we, I don't know how to do, but Lord, we know that, that you will guide us. And Father, I pray for this, for each one of us, that you would just give us wisdom that is not our own, and I pray this in your son's name, Jesus. Amen.